What is good, everybody? We are live here on the Blue Bloods FCS Football Central. Myself, my guy, Coach Fred. We're two live streams back to back here for the Coach's Corner. Coach, let the people know who we bring in today on the Coach's Corner. Probably one of the biggest special guests that, man, we probably had on the show thus far. Man, uh, this guy right here really needs no introduction. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with him in 2014, uh, winning his first uh, HBCU National Championship here at Alcorn State. Uh, good friend, man. Learned a lot from him. My guy, Coach Willie Simmons, Florida boy. What's up? What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? Good, good. Hey, doing good, man. Doing good, man. We got a lot to talk about. I know a lot of people have been waiting to hear from you, been wanting to wish you congratulations. I know for me and Coach, we talked beforehand, man. Congrats on the new opportunity. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about this past season, man, because me and you talked at SWAC Media Day about being one game away for multiple seasons. And I think me and Coach talked about it on our show, the emotions on the sideline when that clock hit zero in Atlanta, you could see it. You hugging your assistants, you hugging Jeremy. Talk about the feel, like the emotions that overcame you about finally breaking through and getting that HBCU National Championship. Uh, no question. Uh, you know, of course, Leroy can tell you, man, um, Wins are hard to come by. Uh, championships are even harder to come by. And, and for us to be, you know, like you said, one game away, really every year since we've been there, uh, to finally get over that hump, to, to finally bring a Celebration Bowl and an HBCU championship back to the highest of Seven Hills uh, was just a surreal moment. And, um, you know, we started that journey in August. You know, we talked about what our ultimate goal was. And you know, we took a one day at approach mentality. And, and uh, but when we finally got to that place, with, with the clock hitting zero, it, it all came rushing down, man. And it's a memory that I have for the rest of my life. And uh, no no better group of guys to, to share it with than those players, the coaches, the support staff, you know, everyone who had a hand in, in making this possible. Coach, me and Coach both both said this. You had a different type of confidence about your team this year. I, I got back from Swap Media Day and I said, Coach, you don't have them on the schedule and it might be a good thing because Willie sounds – real confident about this team. When did you know this team was as special as they ended up being? Well, we knew we had a talented team. Um, you know, we worked extremely hard in the recruiting process to, to build our roster the right way. Uh, we felt really good about the defensive linemen that we had brought in, the offensive linemen that we had brought in. Uh, we already had the quarterback, and we already had some dynamic playmakers. And so when we looked at the team from top to bottom, the key areas where you need quality depth, we felt we had it. And so we knew that we were more than likely the most talented team in the conference, top to bottom. Uh, but we knew that we had a special team once we really started practicing and seeing how those guys came together, push one another. The, the competition was at an all time high every single day. The ability to overcome adversity, uh, to kind of let things roll out their sleeve. Uh, and, and then once we lost the game to South Florida, uh, sitting in that locker room, looking at the fact that we you know, lost the game by two touchdowns to a team that ended up with a winning record, you know, beat the team really, really bad in the bowl game. And, you know, we, we walked away from that game saying, hey, guys, we don't turn the ball over five times. We probably beat this team. And, and from that point on, I think the guys really bought into what we were saying, that the little things matter. You know, it wasn't about our talent. It wasn't about our depth. It was about those little things that we talk about day in and day out. And those guys really committed themselves to doing that and, and the rest is history. With that being said, and uh and then coach, before I talk you go to the coach. No, I said with you being a Florida guy, um, and being so close uh to fam, family ties, uh, I've always wanted to ask you, what was was there added pressure to bring that? So uh what like, I, what I was saying was um, you know, what I, what I wanted to make sure I didn't do is put any undue pressure on the, on the kids. And so being from there, obviously, you know, I knew what the expectations were and we just tried to make sure that our guys understood that the, what we told them, the only team that we felt could beat FAMU was, was FAMU. And if we did the little things right, took care of our business, uh, that everything else would take care of itself. So, you know, growing up there, obviously it was great, but again, I, I was conscious uh, to not allow that, hometown pressure, quote unquote, to 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 derail what we had started there. We felt we had, you know, that we had built something special and, and that it would come together, you know, if we just continue to work hard. Coach, you know, you guys win the HBCU National Championship, win the first Celebration Bowl in school history. 
you make the transition to Duke as the running backs coach under head coach Manny Diaz. Everyone's kind of been wondering when was that decision made and what was just your thought process behind that was the next step in your career? Well, we made the decision, you know, right. That started a new year. Um, you know, Coach Diaz reached out shortly after the Celebration Bowl win um, and expressed his interest in, in bringing me on as the running backs coach. So had a conversation with, with uh, VPAD Sykes, uh, talked about, the, you know, the pros and the cons, um, talked about some things I thought were important for the program uh, to move forward, whether I was the head coach or not. And, you know, they went about trying to acquire those things. And, and I tipped my hat to Rattler Nation. They, they you know, showed up in a major way. You know, raise over one hundred and forty thousand dollars, I believe, in twenty four hours, and so that just the commitment uh, of Rattler Nation to show what they're capable of doing. You know, my wife and I, we we we're praying people, and you know, we we prayed uh, for direction and clarity uh, when it comes to my career. Uh, well, I was very adamant about my career goals. I wanted to be a Power Five head football coach, and so when the when Coach Diaz called uh, the opportunity to come to Duke. Um, you know, we just felt that that it was God's way of answering our prayers as far as opening a door that, uh, you know, with someone who I knew personally during our time together, um, I know what type of man, uh, man he is. I know what he stands for, know what he believes in, uh, and I know what type of program he wants to run, you know, and, and the opportunity to come and coach here at a place like Duke uh, in the ACC where I played college ball uh, in a phenomenal conference uh, and, and to be able to, you know, you know continue to grow my career um it was 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 an opportunity that i thought was too good to pass up you know again i truly enjoyed my time at famu um it was definitely hard to leave and hard to make that that, that difficult decision a uh, difficult decision uh to to move on but you know i just felt uh, again from from prayer and from just talking to my mentors and people in the profession that i trust that the timing was right and it was the, the, the right opportunity uh for, for me to to take on this new uh this new challenge a lot of people talked about it, and including myself and Coach Fred, that you're a national championship head coach. You dominated the SWAC. You were a winner in the MIAC. You won it. You won during your time at PV. Was this one of your first opportunities to move up, or has there been another offer to be an offensive coordinator, or even a head coach at the FBS level, or did you feel like this was what you had to do to eventually get to that point? Well, there have been um, uh, some uh, some opportunities, you know, prior, but the, the timing wasn't right, uh, the situation wasn't right, and, and so again, you know, our prayer was always that everything aligned, and we truly felt that this was the first time that everything had aligned. You know, it was sometimes it was a situation where I felt that, you know, the timing wasn't right for me to leave FAMU. You know, that we had unfinished business. Um, the timing wasn't right for me to leave the staff. You know, sometimes those jobs came later in the cycle after the convention. And you got a bunch of guys who, you know, will be out of a job. Um, you know, sometimes the job just didn't feel right. <laughs> you know, uh, this time it seems like everything came together. Uh, you know, we just came off a national championship at FAM, you know, have built the program up to where I think it's sustainable. Um, it's early enough in the hiring cycle that guys were able to go to the convention and talk to their, their colleagues and pre, uh, friends in the profession and, you know, potentially get jobs. Um, and this situation was 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 you know right for me as far as the timing of it. So um, everything just just came together perfectly. Uh, there were no um, reservations and no 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 second thoughts about whether it was the right situation or the right job or you know you got a coach on the front end of his uh, tenure here. <laughs> you know, so you're not going into a situation where you're in a contract year where you know you got to win or they're going to get fired. And so again, everything just seemed to to, to play out the way that. Uh, we prayed about it, and um, you know, again, we 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 boldly came into this situation, um, looking forward to, the, to again this new challenge. Coach, before I toss it to coach, the the big question is, and a lot of people wanted to know, when you told the administration that you were going to take the Duke job, did they ask for your recommendation on who you thought potentially could be the next head coach at Florida A and M? Well, they didn't necessarily ask for my recommendation. Um, you know, the, Tiff and I had talks prior to um <clears throat> about what i um felt would be you know uh, I, I don't want to say in the best interest um but what i why i felt continuity was would be a positive um did not tell her to hire anyone in particular um i spoke with her in detail about the coaches on my staff uh but i you know gave some references of 
some some programs that you know had been extremely productive. Um, but yeah, so you know, I, I just kind of gave some examples as to why uh, as the programs that promoted from within and that were able to continue uh, what had been built. You know, so um, but no, never never told uh, VP Sykes who she should hire or gave any. Um, you know, we talked about individuals on the staff that I felt would be qualified to lead the program. One of those guys being James Cozen. Cool. And um, you kind of touched on it a few seconds ago. Your relationship with Manny, how far do y'all go back? Uh, we go all the way back to 2007 uh, when I was the running back coach at Middle Tennessee State. He was the defensive coordinator. Oh, so y'all so Okay. We worked together. Yeah, we worked together for three years. And, um, you know, so, again, got to see him run a, a top-notch Sunbelt defense, um, was instrumental in us having the best regular season in, in, in Division One program history. Uh, when our first bowl game, um, you know, again, and put guys in the NFL, conference players of the year. So just, you know, saw how he manufactured a, a top-notch defense. And obviously followed his career, you know, once he left Middle Tennessee and, and became a Power 5 defensive coordinator and then eventually head coach of the University of Miami. So, you know, always been a guy that I've, you know, follow. Um, I had the privilege to to work with his son, my first year at Florida and them. Um, you know, Colin was a student assistant for us. Um, you know, during his time at Florida State, and so again, just you know, keeping that relationship, and that's important. We talk about it to our players all the time. You know, relationships matter, and because of the relationship that we developed during our time working together, and that we sustain, you know, over the years, um, you know, was I think the impetus of him extending this offer to me. And, uh, you know, going back uh, again, some things that you said with that South Florida game, uh, you know, being right there at the doorstep of being able to make that happen and, uh, you know, showing those guys on paper. Uh, I know you said you, that was the turning point, but was that the turning point for you saying, you know what, I, I ain't lost a step. I can still do this at this level. Uh, just waiting on the opportunity. Well, I think many of us, and I'm sure you can relate, um, have kind of felt that given equal circumstances that we can that we can perform at this level. Um, you know, we've, I think we've talked about it even when we were together. You know, like you look at teams with all the resources and being able to recruit four and five star recruits yearly, um, just the ability to develop those guys and to to you know put put a product on the field. Um, to show that is something that I think deep down all of us really want. And so, you know, we're blessed to, to have jobs and to be able to work with young men, regardless of the level. You know, we were very blessed to be there at Alcorn State. I mean, I'm sure you're still blessed to be there now. And, yeah. um, you know, but as we navigate uh, our careers in different places, again, I think any any player that I've ever coached, I said, if you don't want to make it to the NFL, I really don't want to coach you, you know, because you're telling me you want to play at the highest level. I think any coach, most coaches will tell you that they would like to coach at the highest level in some capacity. Um, you know, I've always aspired to be a head coach. And so for me, I would love to to see if I could be a head coach and be successful at, at the highest level. You know, I've done it at the FCS level, um, you know, for over a decade now and or close to a decade, nine years. And, you know, again, I, I, I think that is something that I would love to be able to show, not to anyone else, but to myself, that, that I can perform at that level. And given the, the the resources, given the the platform, that I can have a positive impact uh, uh, on that community, but a greater impact on the overall landscape of college football, because um, I think we can all agree that the direction it's headed in is could be very dangerous if enough of us don't speak up about some of the things that are happening and, and taking away some of the, the the true reasons why these young men come to these places to play college football. And, um, you know, with that, uh, we'll, we'll transition into a little muddy water, so to speak. Um, what What is your thought, man, sitting there right now where you are and kind of looking at what you built there at FAM and, and what's going on now? I mean, what what's your inner feeling uh, with watching all that? Well, uh, again, growing up there and working there for six years, everybody better understand that that, that Rattler Nation is, is passionate. Uh, they're very passionate about their, their university. Uh, they're very passionate about their their, their athletic programs, uh, particularly the football program. 
And so uh, any feeling or thought that um, a decision could be made that would, you know, make the program go in, in, in the opposite direction of where it's been going uh, will be met with, with intense criticism. <laughs> and I think that's a part of understanding the landscape there. So any person in leadership at FAMU, I, I tell them all, you, you got to have thick skin. You know, you, you got to be willing to take the good and the bad. You got to be ready to, to take the criticisms. Um, you know, there are a lot of people vested. Uh, there are a lot of people given, and, and those people have voices, and they're going to voice their opinions, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, and, and that just comes, it, it comes along with leadership. And, and I think anyone who wants to be a head coach, an athletic director, a president of university, uh, you have to be willing to, to take that on and, and not run away from it. You know, and I think the most the, the most successful coaches, the most successful ADs and, and, and administrators have that uncanny ability to to listen to the criticisms, to not internalize them, um, but, you know, make decisions that that you feel are in the best interest of your program. Some that are gonna, that are going to be met with criticism. And, and, and um, so, so, again, it's part of it. Um, my thought always goes to the student athlete everything I do, everything I've always done in this profession has been for the student athletes. So I really, you know, and, and people can take it whatever way they want to. I really could care less what grown people think, adults think. Um, I care about what affects those student athletes because they're the ones that go out there, you know, 11 to 13 Saturdays out of the year to represent that institution. They're the ones that, that bleed, that sweat, that cry, that put their lives literally on the line you know, to play a game they love for whatever institution gives them an opportunity to. And and if we don't make decisions with their best interests in mind, then we're failing them. And so, you know, I, I don't really read a lot of chats uh, because most of the chats aren't <clears throat> centered around the student athlete. They're centered around decisions about coaches, about play calls, um, those type of things. And, you know, again, as a, as a leader, you got to be able to, to withstand that stuff. And it gets frustrating at times if you allow it to. You know, fortunately for me, I've just been a person that has always been able to kind of deal with it, not let it really stress me out, and just go about doing my job because I know why I do it. I think whenever you truly understand why you do something, the outside criticisms don't bother you. You know, and that's something that even we talk about here at Duke, uh, about not really worried about, you know, recruiting rankings and worried about, Mm -hmm. who we sign and what people think about the players that we sign. We get to do it our way because we understand and know why we do this. And I think that's a critical uh, and central theme in every, that it should be in everyone's lives. If you know your purpose and you know your why, then the criticism don't really bother you. And so, um, but my thoughts go out to those players. You know, we, we left a great group of guys to there. Um, there's some fine young men that are doing some amazing things in the classroom, on the field, out in the community. And, and and whoever leads them needs to understand that and continue to, to to push those guys to be their very best because they will respond just like they responded to everything that we've asked them to do over the last year they'll respond uh to to whoever comes in whether that's somebody in house whether that's somebody externally uh, if their number one goal and their passion is the development of young men they'll be successful and that was the whole point of our program well before i throw it to you zach one, one question uh, you run your own Twitter, man. <laughs> yeah, I run my own Twitter. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Coach. I mean, it, and me and Coach Fred have had this conversation about the hiring process, especially the way FCS coaches and even HBCU coaches to a whole nother level are looked upon for Power Five jobs for FBS jobs. As you've been through multiple interviews. What do you like just from your perspective? What is the disconnect there in terms of you see a guy like you who just won a national championship, not get the head coach's spot? You see Matt Entz, a two time national champion, have to go be an assistant on USC staff. In your opinion, what's the disconnect between FCS successful FCS head coaches and FBS positions? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, you know, for a long time, you know, we uh, equated it to, to, to color and race. But, you know, Matt Enns is a white guy, so you can't really, you know, use that in, in this particular situation. Um, I think the biggest thing is that the gap is, is widening between FCS and FBS uh, at, at the end of the day. 
uh, everything from exposure to resources to you name it, you know, TV contracts, conference realignment, um, the FBS is, is further distancing themselves from FCS. You look at the buyouts now for FCS teams having to move up to FBS. It went from like $5,000 to $5 million. <laughs> like it, they pretty much said, all right, we're capping this thing at 130 or whatever it is now. And we're, and we're not letting anyone else come join the party. Right. So there's a, there's a distinction between F, division one FCS and division one FBS. And so when you look at things such as NIL, uh, even a transfer portal, um, all of the new changes to, to, to college football, um, I think athletic directors and, and, and decision makers kind of want people who, who, you know, played in that sandbox. And so I think coaches like myself, like Matt Inns, like other coaches that have been successful had some tough decisions to make. Do we leave our posts and our positions as head coaches at the FCS level to get in that rat race called Division One FBS? Or do you keep your leadership positions and hope that the rare occasion that a coach leaves an FBS program as a head coach and gets a group of five or five, five head job, uh, it, which just hasn't happened a whole lot, you know? So the, the, the numbers suggest that way more coaches have taken the route that I've taken than have taken the route that maybe Deion Sanders took to be named head coach at a power five coming from an HBCU. Because mind you, in the 40 years that I've been living, 43 to be exact, um, it's only happened twice. And that's Deion Sanders last year. And obviously that's the guy that employed, you know, Leroy and I, Jay Hobson, leaving Alcorn to go to Southern Miss. But in, in that time in 40 plus years, uh, no other coach has left an FBS, FCS, particularly HBCU, that's an HBCU program to, to become a head coach at, at an FBS program. Yeah, I mean, I, I, being an FCS program here, and I know you guys both coach at HBCU ranks, is something that blows my mind, especially when you look at a guy like Kalen DeBoer right now, who was a head coach at Sioux Falls. How did that guy win five national titles and have, still have to go to Fresno State to prove himself as a winner? It just it, it shows all that. But, Coach, as as you move on to Duke here, I know you I know you just stepped in, so maybe you can't answer this yet. What's the biggest difference between recruiting at as a head coach at the FCS level compared to what you're having to do now in the ACC at Duke? Well, the biggest challenge us at Duke obviously are the academic requirements. Um, <laughs> They, they they are indeed rigorous um you know so just navigating that uh, of course it really shrinks down the the, the pool of, of individuals that you can recruit um and, and, you know even at places like florida and m and alcorn state and other hbcus um we still wanted to recruit a high profile kid academically uh, because the reality that we knew we didn't have the resources oftentimes academically to 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 help certain students uh matriculate and so you know you you, you got to get some self-motivated kids you got to get some kids that are strong in certain areas uh because again uh you know florida and m is, is a very difficult place uh, the average gpa of the freshman class this past year was a, was a 4.0 and so you know you got student athletes in their class with students who who are in the top five and ten percent of their classes respective high school classes and so the, the being able to keep up in those classes when you're practicing 20 hours a week when you're traveling you know from itabina mississippi back to tallahassee and getting back at 7 a.m you know <laughs> having to turn around and go to weights at one and be on the field that evening at at, at seven for practice you know it, it's, it's rigorous and so we you know wanted to make sure we did a good job of identifying young men who could not only get in the family but also stay there you know and, and I, I commend the uh, uh, athletic uh, the university administration for making the commitment uh, the, this past year to, to improving the number of academic advisors within the program. Uh, for, for three years, we had one, believe it or not. Uh, we had one <laughs> academic advisor for 300 plus student athletes. And again, I see Leroy laughing because it was the same way for us at Alcorn back during our time. You know, you can imagine one person trying to advise 300 plus student athletes, different sports, different majors, different classifications, some with learning disabilities, you name it, and you're trying to navigate all of that, you know, so it was virtually impossible to to provide the support that a lot of the students needed, 
you know, and, and so again, I, I, I think the, the administration recognized that this past year, not saying they didn't recognize it before, um, but for whatever reason, there was a there was a, a more concerted effort to provide the resources. And, you know, we were able to have four academic advisors, uh, along with, I think, five or six people in compliance. And we saw a complete turnaround of, of our academic profile for our student athletes, primarily football. And, and I think they go hand in hand, you know, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, Coaches, yes, we do have a responsibility to 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 push our men to check classes, to you know have academic meetings, and to do all the things that it takes to to ensure the success. But I have a three year old daughter, a six year old son, and an eight year old daughter. I have a hard time, and, and I'm a guy that graduated high school with a four point GPA, graduated from Clemson for three years. I have a hard time helping my eight year old with our homework. I mean, the the the, the 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 curriculums is getting a lot harder. I was junior in high school. I, I wouldn't even dare look at her homework. Yeah, I'm not even going. I'm not going to even fool myself and think that I can help her. And she's she's number one in her class. But so again, yeah, we can check study hall, but I can't help any of those guys with their with their calculus and their trigonometry and and all these subjects that they're taking now. And you know, so it, it takes people who are experts in that field. It takes academic advisors. It takes uh, tutors. You know, it takes all those people to do that. And uh, again, I do commend the administration for recognizing that, um, but that that's probably the biggest challenge. I know I kind of went on a tangent there, but that's my that's the biggest challenge here. Uh, but we do have the support. You know, I, I was blown away in our team meeting two days ago that the average GPA this past fall, the football, I'm not the average, yeah, the average GPA was a 3.11, you know, which is the highest I've ever seen <laughs> from a football program. So, uh, again, just a different demographic that we're um, recruiting. Uh, because most of these kids have to be top five, top percent of their respective classes coming out of high school. Uh, before I toss about the coach to, to wrap this one up, your coaching trees are always a big deal. And I'm sure you've heard it on Scotty's show, other shows in the space. Everyone talks about HBCU coaching trees. You look at KJ Black on the Rams staff. They're about to go to the playoffs. Possibly one of your assistants is going to be the head coach at fam. You possibly take other jobs. When you look at your coaching tree, what does it mean to you to see the guys that you help bring up through the coaching ranks be so successful when they finally step away and take over programs and, and get those bigger opportunities? Well, I, I think the, the mark of any good leader is that they develop future leaders. Um, you know, you look at the staff we had at Alcorn State. Um, you know, I became a head coach. Fred Minera, head coach. Uh, Tony Pecoraro, FBS defensive coordinator. Ralph Street. FBS defensive coordinator, uh, uh, position coach, you know, Ryan Stanchek, you know, FBS position coach, uh, Cedric Thomas, head coach, uh, Mickey Joseph, head coach. You know, I mean, so you look at that staff, there were a lot of guys that didn't have a lot of major college experience, but who went on to be, you know, really, really great coaches. And, and I think that's the mark of a really good leader, you know, and, and we talk about that staff all the time. I mean, man, we had a phenomenal staff, but, you know, a bunch of guys that push one another to be our very best. And, and our players fed, fed, you know, they they, they saw that and, and fed off that. Uh, but again, when I look at my quote unquote coaching tree, um, I think that's what you want to see. You want to see that you develop guys and help them achieve the, their goals in the coaching profession. And so whether that's coaching at the LPS level, whether that's becoming coordinators, uh, or ultimately head coaches, you know, I, I think that's that's a, a telling sign that the program is headed in the right direction. And, and so I'm proud of guys like, you know, uh, Kenneth Gilstrap, you know, Bubba McDowell, you know, who I coached at, uh, who I, who's on the staff with me at Prairie View, KJ, as you alluded to, Ralph Street, uh, who's an FBS position coach, Ryan Stanchek again, you know, who I hired, who's, a, who's now an FBS position coach. Um, you know, again, those guys are doing great things. I mean, Ryan Smith, my defense coordinator over the last three years, I'm not sure why he's not an FBS coordinator yet. Um, if there are any other coordinators in the country that have orchestrated three top 10 defenses nationally over the last three years, I'd like to see where they are now. You know, and he's, he's one of the best I've ever been around. So um, great group of guys, you know, um, but, but I think, again, the mark of any great leader is that they're developing leaders themselves and, and that those guys can continue to, 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 to go and do things that they want to do in the profession. And time will tell, you know, what that looks like. Uh, from the guys that have worked with me over the years. Go ahead, Coach. Man, as we close out, Brad, I just want you to take pictures 
Uh, you there at the right time. Uh, that Duke North Carolina basketball game, I hear it's everything is advertised to be. Um, and I know you like hoops, so make sure you take pictures, man. Again, uh, thank you. Uh, best of luck to you. Uh, got your number, you know, I'll be in touch and uh, keep pushing, bro. Well, hey, not just I mean, Cameron Indoor Stadium is literally right behind me out of my office. I'm looking at Cameron Indoor, so I mean, got a great view. Uh, this is amazing, but but tickets are impossible to come by. I didn't even <laughs> ask about Duke, Carolina. I already know I'm not even gonna be able to get in that one. So maybe when you know Syracuse or somebody comes, if my alma mater Clemson comes to town, I may try to watch that one. But now you'll, you'll see students sleeping outside for days waiting to get take, get inside Cameron Indoor. Man, it's it's one of the hottest tickets in America. But uh, again, just great to be a part of this tradition, man. You know, I kind of walked through campus a little bit yesterday and went and had lunch, but you. You walk, and I saw a poster with, you know, uh, Williamson and, and Tatum and, you know, B Ranchero, uh, Banchero. I, I mean, Grant Hill and, and I mean, uh, Kyrie yeah. Irving. You're like, holy, Grant. Like, you just start remember all these guys that played here, you know, in the history. Of, I forgot. They, I just forgot that Kyrie played there. Kyrie I played did too. There. Yeah, Kyrie played there. So then, you know, but right around the bridge, it's, it's just going to be, you know, and so that's – it just the, the history of this place, man, uh, is second to none. Uh, so, again, just an extreme blessing. I, I can't thank M Manny enough for just this tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, but at the same time, I, I, I feel really good about the, the direction of Florida a and You know, and I know right now there's some dark clouds, no pun intended, um, you know, hovering over the program right now because of the uncertainty of who's going to lead the program next. Uh, but, again, I, I, I just encourage Rattler Nation you know, like they've done all, you know, since I've been old enough to really follow that place. Um, there's passion as passion that comes, and they're going to voice their opinions, continue to do so. But like I've always said, remember at the end of the day, the product is and will always be the student athlete. And, and so they need they need support more than ever. You know, again, with the change of landscape of college athletics, what the NCAA is allowing to happen as far as cost of attendance, you know, NIL and all these things uh, has never been a greater opportunity to really show these student athletes how much you support them by making sure that their college experience is the best that it can be. And I'm not saying make them rich, but there are ways to make their college experience be great, whether they're not struggling to figure out how they're going to you know, fly their parents to games, how they're going to take their significant others out on a date. You know, I, I remember having to figure those things out when I was in college because there was no NIL, there was no cost of attendance. Now we have those things in place. Uh, our alum at our respective institutions can really do some great things. So um, I, I don't think you've heard the last of Florida and them football. I feel really good about that. Uh, I know Leroy may not want to hear that, you know, being that they're still in the same conference, but um, I, I think we built it up enough that it's sustainable because um, people win at the end of the day, people win. And there's some great people there within that program, some great players within that program. And, and I think with the right push and the right support that um, everything Rattler Nation wants can be achieved in, in short time. So again, thank you guys. Appreciate being on and I uh, look forward to, to, uh, to catching up in the future. Uh, absolutely, Coach, man. Anytime you want to come on, I know me and Coach, listen, I don't have an ACC team we root for. I don't think either one of us do, but we're going to be hoping Duke wins that ACC championship next year. So you Love already know it. we'll be behind you. But, guys, um, shout out to Willie Simmons for hopping on the show. For, my, for myself, my guy, Coach Fred, and the Blue Bloods, man, we are out. Yeah.